Right, so a couple of things before we get into it. As you can see, I'm very serious about this video. I even got myself a selfie stick. So, you know, it's going to be good. Um, so the title of the video, I left permaculture for my family, is a little bit of clickbaity, but I want you to stick with me because it's going to be good. Um, let me show you this. So as you can see, I'm obviously back. The farm has grown. There's little cowpeas coming up here. And uh, okay, so I left my family for four days or I left permaculture for four days because I had to go to the coast and I want to take you along with me. So in this video, I'm going to take you along to the Skeleton Coast. I'm going to take you on a road trip through the desert. Um, I'm going to show you very, very secluded fishing spots. I'm going to show you some crystals. I am going to tell you why or how I branded my brother like a common stock animal and uh, why I suggest you do the same. Uh, one more thing before we get into it. I always for, uh, forget this part. I work for comments. Please comment. I have 898 subscribers. If you have nothing else to say, just comment the amount of subscribers you see by the time you view this video. That would be fantastic. Um, I have fantastic people subscribed to me already. So if you're one of them, go subscribe to David the Good. He's awesome. And if you're not one of the awesome people, subscribe to me yet. I don't know what to say. Just do it. Hit the little button. Plant a, plant a finger there on the subscribe button. I'll see you now. This is the kids. There's eight drums yes. of worms below them. Are you excited for the weekend? Yes. yes. We're going to our grandma and grandpa. Yay. Again, this is Kalkfeld. This is probably the dirtiest town in Namibia. And uh, the other one doesn't look like this. Um, if, I don't know if you can see there. This is what the town looked like. This, this specific town always gives me the idea of absolute poverty and hopelessness. Let me show you the next one. So this is the area between Kalkfeld and Omoruru. That mountain seems a lot larger in real life. As you can see, I almost didn't get any rain this year. This is what the felt looks like. There's almost nothing. If you have to feed animals on this, it becomes very, very difficult. There in the distance, there's the Irongo Mountains. And uh, yeah, it's nice and hot. We are very sweaty and sticky. Let me show you Omaruru. So this is Omaruru, and I wish I could show you more. It's below giant trees nestled on the banks of the Umaruru River. Now for us a river is normally a dry river because it runs maybe three days in the week. But this town, if there's any town that was ready in Namibia for permaculture, I would say it is Umaruru. It is very arty. There's about, um, I would say about 100 people retired here. So lots of dispensable income. Um, water that runs once a year through the river and uh, general willingness to be different and to be strange. Um, they have an art festival once a year, they are strange people. Um, it's on the southern edge of Damara land, so Damara land is very, very uh, arid, very, very arid. And uh, so they can, if this becomes a hub for permaculture in Namibia, then they would be able to teach the Damra people how to use their permaculture principles as well. Okay, so this is Karabup, 200 kilometers from our house. As you can see, that is where the rich people of town are staying. That is the tinsel town there in the distance. And this is mainly a mining town basically forming a T-junction, so that's the bridge there behind the truck where we came down. It is a T-junction between the, um, if you move from the coast towards the main, main city Vintuk, or if you move from the coast towards the inner land Ochivarongo where we are, this is the T-junction. And so this road is busy, but it's business, 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 nothing else matters, just money, mining, money, money. So this is Isokos, this is 
very windy town. I'll put a picture up all the signs when we drove in. Was out. This is on the border of the Namib Desert, and it felt like for the last 80 kilometers we were driving downhill, and then it's difficult to see. But up there, there's a hill. I'll measure it now. We'll go uphill for 10 kilometers. Very steep uphill. So when you drive up there, you just see, yeah, yeah, we should put a swale here, yeah, we should put a swale here. Yeah. I quickly want to show you some of our traditional food. This is called bultong. And you can see it's very almost a roll. It's wind dried meat. So we take cattle and dry it. Um, or all kinds of meat. This is drovors. This is a sausage that's also been dried in the wind, not cooked at all. Very similar to the jerky, I think that you find in America, except this is cooked. Oh, not cooked at all. No, no fire, no smoke, no nothing. And then these things are chili bites. They make them from the offcuts of the meat. Now the bultong. You see these ones. It's got fat on them. And so when you buy game bultong, they are very, very dry, with no fat, venison bultong. And so you dip them in a little bit of butter and you eat them like that. Right, now you've seen one of our cuisines as well. I'll measure that boat for you and then I'll show you, show you the desert quickly. To leave Isakos, you reach this place. Um, it's just on the edge of the desert. Um, and there's a lot of Damara people here that come and sell the crystals that they mine out of those mountains there. I hope you can see the shot. I cannot see the screen in the sun. I hope you can see the mountains there. This is the, some of the crystals that you find inside. Yeah. All the different is the All the different ones. What is the price of this one? This one. Yeah? This one, it was also 150. Yeah, what is, so 150, that's about Seven seven dollars fifty US dollars seven US dollars fifty. This will eat two hundred water discount. Let me show you this one. Sorry, I don't face it. What's the price of this black one? The price of the black one is one hundred and fifty. Hundred and fifty. It's the same as this whole pack, yeah. Yeah. 150 that's also about seven dollars seven seven us dollars what's the name of this rock black, black tourmaline black tourmaline and it's very very heavy eh? and uh, actually no die cake what is the name of this green one fluoride fluoride and where do you find them spitz copper nice and you have this amethyst. Amethyst comes from Am uh, amethyst. From Uy, uh, from Uy side, Kobo from Uy's area. Yeah, Uy's area. Okay. The, the green is highlight on quartz. It's feldspar. 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 Yeah, from Irongo. Uh, Irongo. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nice. Are these ones the ones with the ultraviolet? Yeah. Yeah. Only, only, only this one. Only this one. Okay. The green. Yeah, the green. Okay. What's this black one? Black, black tourmaline. Same, same. Black, black tourmaline. Same, same, same thing. What's this uh, little blue one here? Yeah, this, this is sotalit. sotalit. Say again? Sotalit. Sotalit. This is police name. Okay. Mm. Okay, please tell me about what you have here. Uh, this is a high lit. High lit? Okay. Yeah, they call it African Obal. African? Opal. Opal, okay. Yeah. And uh, so that's, that's an ultraviolet light that you sh shine on it. Yeah, eh? they got fluorescent, that's why they are glowing with the ultraviolet light. Okay, that's nice. And what is this golden golden it's, ones here? It's called a pyrite. Pyrite, okay. Yeah, fool's gold. Pirate gold. Fool's Pirate gold, yeah. Pirate gold, okay, that's very interesting. It's heavy, eh? Yeah. Okay, what else do you have that's interesting here? Sopkamiki? Uh, this is uh, smoky quartz. Smoky quartz. Yeah, and black wow. tourmaline. And with the high lid, you see? And high lid inside. What is the price of a rock like this? Uh, actually, this one, it's 600. 600, so that. So, 70 kilometers from Isakos. 
and 70 kilometers from the coast you find this cross now once you reach this cross this is more or less where we normally lose our personalities especially when we drive in a car without the aircon you lose your personality and you start fighting and you start bickering about everything and you think your life is terrible and so they, somebody came and they placed this cross next to the road in a little place there's a thing that used to be a toilet there it doesn't work anymore and then on the cross there's a petrol pump a petrol pipe just to refill your spirit and then on the cross it says for God so loved much so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to whomever believe in him should not perish but believe in everlasting but have everlasting li life sorry I messed that up and so the story of this cross is we started stopping here um, just because we want to refresh a little bit um, and it's the last stop before the coast and so one day my wife said well let's pray and so we prayed and then we began doing that and so this this became a thing and uh, then one day we just drove past and then the kids stopped us and they said are we not going to stop and pray and so we turned stopped turned around and we came back and we prayed at the cross again and so then it became our little tradition became their tradition and something that they reminded us of as well Dono is just shooting his kitty slingshot in English I think anyway and so obviously I was very very glad to have something that I can share with the kids and especially something so special and it made me realize that if I want to or my sister actually then I told her the story and she said um, one of the things that keeps families together is when they have traditions they share so for me I try to make little traditions um, that I can share with my kids because one day that is something that they will remember and that's something that will bring them back to the house, um, to my house and to come and visit me. So this is the area where my brother and my father build their houses, um, where they live. This is on the edge of the moon landscape, about 10 kilometers from Swakopmund. Now once a year, all of our children, this is my father's six children and their wives and husbands and so on, and the 23 Garand children all meet here and we have family time. The rest of the year they run it as a self-catering place um, and the views from here is fantastic. Even though the weather can change in like five minutes, it can go from beautiful to absolutely horrible. The views you get from here is incredible. There's also a fantastic nursery close by and if you want to go to the coast it's just about a couple of kilometers away. Um, so moons are fantastic. And so this is really, really a magical place for me. So this is the mall at Chocomund. So we went to the doctors this morning, Mika and my wife. And uh, this is basically what the mall looks like. So we're going to leave the ladies here and then we're going to head north to go do some fishing. Four hours north. Once you leave Swakopmund, you keep on driving next to the coast to the north. As you can see, it's very foggy. This is one of the most foggiest places in the world next to the Skeleton Coast. And so you keep on driving like that. And uh, obviously, you start losing your personality. My Spotify stopped working. I couldn't listen to any music. So it was just me and the kids chatting about everything in life. You stay about three kilometers away from the coast at all times. So every year and there you still see the sea. And as you can see, these roads are salt roads made with salt. One of the interesting things is right here in the middle of nowhere, every year and there, every couple hundred meters or couple of kilometers, you get a shop like this. Somebody living maybe somewhere in those mountains over there possible I have no idea but what they do is they put a little table and you can see this thing is extremely worn out and they put crystals 
that. And it might be even salt crystals or some other crystals. And then you put money in there for them. And you take a crystal. But there's no prices written down. So it's completely voluntary. You choose what you want to pay for each crystal. And so there's a shop there. There's a shop a couple hundred meters that way and a couple hundred meters back. And it looks like these are mostly the crystals that you can buy. Now this is the gate to the Skeleton Coast or to Tora Bay. And so um, once you arrive here, you still have to drive another 115 kilometers on the salt road. So this was the worst part for me as a child. Uh, you drive forever and you get to the, to the gates and you believe this is it, we've arrived, get back in the car and you spend another almost hour and a half in the car. Because of these salt roads, um, you drive a little bit slower. So the final stage, just before you enter the camp, you go over a little hill. So you don't see the camp, you don't see the camp and then all of a sudden you go over this hill and here's the camp in front of you. And that feels a bit like heaven. And so, um, yeah, these are always memory invoking drives for me. So here we have the boys changing the tire. One is holding the jack in place while the other ones are turning. And obviously we supervise it a little bit so they don't get hurt. So the vastness of our fishing spot. You can go 70 kilometers that way without seeing a soul. Hundreds of kilometers that way without seeing a soul. And about 200 kilometers that way without seeing a soul. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people in the in this 200 kilometers of here. We are catching from the cliffs. There's no way for us to get down there without running the risk as the tides are now, without running the risk of the tides catching us between the sea and the and the cliffs. So we are catching there. Dino and Vickers and Small Andy caught their first fishes, so it's only the grown-ups and Ben that hasn't caught anything yet. So I've been tasked to teach the kids to clean the fish while the rest finish setting up the camp. Taking out. So we only got these little coolies today. That's what they look like, a bunch of them. We haven't been there that long. Is it right, man? Yeah. Let's clean it. Sunset in the desert. That is our camp area there in the back. So today the tides allowed us to get below the walls. And so here you can see the millennia of rocks and sand and rocks and sand that was deposited. So there's all the boys. Even Benji, my father and my brother. So this is what a bait look like. This we call red bait. It looks like that. Washes up in onto the beach and things like this. But breaks from the rocks and then washes up. Then we use filters. These little guys. And mussel, white mussels that we buy from a bait shop. And uh, there's some more red bait that we picked up on the beach. And this is our fishing setup. By far one of my favorite parts of this kind of holiday of ours is this preparing fish. Right after we caught it, these are cob. And uh, we are all starving Marvin because we are boys we didn't bring any food and uh, so a fish is gonna go down well now so currently there is no signal but on a good day you get signal on this little hill here 
Cloud cover is just right. And today is it's such a day. We finally got to phone our wives. And uh, we heard about this little hill. So we drove. Our camp is zoom in five times. Somewhere there. But uh, yeah, we drove out until we found this little hill. Kids are waiting in the car. And we got to phone our wives to tell them we're okay. So this is Torabai. This is where we camp. It is about 300, 400 kilometers from Swakopmund, if I'm correct. Water tank. Brand new shop. Four years old or so. This is the old shop. Now there's a couple of stories that I want to tell you about the place. Um, Torabai was founded about 76 years ago, if I'm not mistaken. And how it happened is the farmers in the north of Namibia said to the government we need a place to fish. In um, Those were the farmers in the area where I'm from, Ochevarongo. And so the government gave them this place. This is actually in a nature protected area and spare a bit because there's so many diamonds here and uh, so they gave them a, an area of about 120 kilometers that they can use for fishing and then this area that they can use for camping where, where, where? now um, <laughs> it's only open from January uh, fr between January and December and there is normally what it was like is my grandmother would pack up her things on a truck with her five kids six kids six kids sorry and they would come here for a month in that stage there was no fridges or anything there was a little paraffin fridge um, but there wasn't enough packing space to pack food for her her family and all of the workers that would come with their families so they would bring live animals and the food for the live animals and keep them here and stay here for a month and they would this so this is a typical camping site just this white rocks over here and they would then stay here for a month so my father grew up that way and then I grew up um, Every second year we would come here, we would drive 2,000 kilometers through the desert to come here. At that stage there was no modern bathrooms like that. Um, we had little reed shacks and inside there was a bucket that you could do your job in. And uh, the water here, at, when I started here, was still water from a fountain close by. So you knew that if you come here for a month, the first two weeks you're gonna have a running stomach so we would come here and you would have a running stomach for two weeks and then two weeks you would have a normal life but going to do your business in a bucket with a running stomach was quite a story now when I started coming here my grandmother already had Alzheimer's and so in that street over there we were staying in the campsite, I guess, more or less over there. And then you would walk this way to the toilets. And uh, she got uh, all the toilets were also in, only in one block. It wasn't as diversified or everywhere dispersed between the campsites like this. And then one day I found her. I was on my way to the showers and I found her and she grabbed a guy's hand and she was talking to him. Now, in our culture, we have the same um, thing as the Indians. We call older people aunt and uncle. And you could see he was, he was sweating and he was stressing and she couldn't pick up on his social signs. She was just holding his hand and talking to him. And then that one stage, he just shouted, I'm sorry, auntie, I'm sorry. And then he uh, pulled his hands loose and he started running for the bathroom because <laughs> he was on his way to the bathroom when she got hold of his hand and started speaking to him. You can see it, but there's dunes there in the back. 
uh, when I was a young child, we went dune boarding and uh, on those dunes I went up there, polished my board, I was about five years old, polished and polished and polished and the uh, adults dune boarded and they enjoyed it and then they saw me polishing this board but they didn't care too much we use floor polish on normal laminated boards and then you hold up the front ends and you go down the dune and you steer with your feet in the back saw me polishing this board didn't think much about it until all of a sudden I decided I'm going now they went down the other side not the ocean side and it's softer I decided now I'm gonna go down the ocean side so I went down the and the, to the people at the bottom it looked like a flying rag coming down the hill and then at the bottom there's a small little heaps I let go of the front got catapulted and I landed a couple of times and got air a couple of times and I think they said between the time I got air and the first place I landed was about 30 meters so I injured myself very very badly and so they jumped in the car took me to the hospital about four hours away and I came back here two days later I guess with a cast around my neck and I made it and I was alive and so that is some of my stories of Torabai <laughs> okay so without planning it in advance this video sort of became about binding families and so I was a little involved in this cult when I was a little bit younger and uh, one there's always real cheese in the mousetrap so one of the true things that this prophet of them said um, was that it's very important to bind families together and so once you bind a family together and say the mother has then got a strong bond with her um, father and her brothers and sisters and then the brother has then got a strong bond again with his family-in-law and so on then you start binding communities together and once you start binding communities together then you change the world into a better place and uh, obviously I believe this to be true and so a couple of things that I, I try to do is I try to play with my kids I try to create inside language with, between me and my wife and between me and the kids words that only us we knew, know and jokes that only we know so there's loads of these things floating around in our family traditions that's ours that uh, other people wouldn't necessarily understand and that binds us together so play words traditions jokes um, time loads of time and so we grew up as a family of six no TV no nothing so we had loads of time together and me and my brother shared a room I was about seven at this stage he was about 14 he's seven years older than me and I always had a unhealthy fascination with fire I like to play with fire and bombs and the bombs is a story for a different time um, but at this the, around this stage I realized that you can buy a whole box of matches for next to nothing so I bought myself a whole box of matches and I was playing in our room lighting these things putting them on the side etc he came into the room and he asked me um, please clean this and I said no and uh, he said you know just kill the fire just stop what you're doing and I said no and so he had a different plan that normally works for him still today he said listen I'm gonna go into the bathroom when I come out this needs to be cleaned otherwise we're gonna have a problem but I'm quite hard-headed always have been and I had a strategy um, what what I what I did when we were younger is my grandmother who had Alzheimer's used to spend a lot of time in our living room so I would frustrate my brother I would be a terrible terrible little brother and whenever he comes to to beat me or to get his own back I would run past her and she would see this 14 year old child chasing the seven year old child and she would grab him and give him a nice talking to so I had scores twice. I could frustrate him. Plus, I would I could get him in trouble for trying to make things right. And so, when he came out of the bathroom, just wearing a pants, no shirt yet, I was still there playing, and he wasn't backing up. So he took my candle, big candle like this, 
blew it out and threw it out the window. And without hesitating, I had four matches in my hand. I lit them and I st st stuck them into his stomach. And so he had this big thing here in his burn in his stomach. Today it's on his back. It moved, moved around. But, uh, and then I, I realized my life's going to be over. So I started running for my grandmother and I never made it. He gave me a, a beating, the beating of my little life. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's maybe not the best inside joke or the inside story to tell, but it is something that binds us together because we were forced to spend time together. It, we, we, we still talk about it and laugh about it today. The beating I received and the, and the branding is, he's still got, he's got my brand here on his back now. So that's the end of my story in this festive season. I would implore you, I think is the right word. I would encourage you. I would like to encourage you to spend time with your family, start the inside joke, start a new tradition that is only yours, that the rest of the world doesn't share with you. Start a tradition with your wife. And I hope you have a wonderful day.